This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways in which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. TV Network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host today on the KJ Show. And boy, what a week has it been. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the breaking news, obviously, in Britain and elsewhere. Uh, but today I also want to talk about something that's making news, maybe not in such a dramatic fashion. Uh, the promise and perils of demand response, or DR programs. Uh, there's been some pushback among customers, and demand response programs are becoming yet another strategy that electric utilities are using to help encourage customers to cut back during peak demand. However, it doesn't always work as planned. But first, I want to certainly start by paying tribute, um, as the rest of the world has, to the Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, who obviously passed away, um, not unexpectedly at 96. But it was interesting to see um, all of the different facets that she was involved in. And one of the things I didn't really know was that Queen Elizabeth was actually very involved in her crown estates in promoting windshore, uh, offshore, wind, offshore wind production. Um, as people may know, the Queen owns every bit of coastline, the seabeds, all the swans, and having met some of her swans, I can tell you they know they're part of the royal tribe or the royal clan. They're very arrogant uh, swans indeed. But the, um, but the Queen actually, as part of the Crown Estates, initiated with uh, Boris Johnson and her advisors one of the largest windshore development, offshore wind development programs in the, in the world. Boris Johnson, the former prime minister, wants to make uh, Britain the Saudi Arabia of the offshore wind market. And if you've ever been there, like I have, the wind does blow quite a bit in Aberdeen, off the coast of Aberdeen, and off all of the different coasts of Britain. And so it's a windy kind of Heathcliff, um, you know, sort of ventures with Wuthering Heights and the Moors. So what the land, what the very smart estate managers wanted to do was to say, hey, why don't we encourage private development to build an offshore wind um, farm that will actually help harness the wind that's owned by the, you know, the wind isn't owned by the cream, but the, the land where, where that is his, and actually help create and support this industry that will create jobs. Obviously, it helps them achieve their zero, 50, zero car, 2050 carbon emission zero um, pledge and also creates, um, you know, another source of renewable energy, uh, which is a little more reliable than the renewable energy of just relying on wind um, from places where it doesn't quite blow so uh, frequently. So they actually have done, with the prop, with their property manager and the treasury, have a billions of dollars they've made in leasing offshore waters to build British Petroleum and all the other major energy players in the wind power business. And so the Queen and her estate very astutely has taken a resource that she has and actually learned how to make money out of it. So when you see all the pomp and circumstance about the queen and her majesty, and it is really quite remarkable, you also realize she was a very shrewd, and her advisors were very shrewd businessmen, and why not take advantage of something that you know will help create uh, another source of energy for her, for her subjects. Uh, switching st switching uh, topics now to something a little more mundane, um, I love it when I come across these articles, uh, again, showing how maybe we should just leave things alone. In California now, they're in the middle of a drought. They've been in a drought on and off for years and years. But they now recruited a new climate change warrior, beavers. Now, I happen to love beavers. I think that they are one of the most impressive rodents, I guess. But the reason I love beavers is because in the beaver world, the mama beaver is the one who oversees the building of the dam, and they're very clever engineers. And I like the fact that the, it's a female is in charge, so that's probably one of the reasons I like the beavers. But they actually are now realizing that when they were hunting the beavers and removing the beavers because they cause nuisance, they were actually creating another problem. The problem is that beavers actually help prevent droughts and create fire 
resistant landscapes. Who knew? I mean, of course they do. They build dams and they capture the not just the snow melt, which isn't really as big a deal, but the groundwater, which has been slowly you know, ebbed away with all the different wildfires and the groundwater with the California has been has really been affected adversely by the drought. So what they're starting to do is they're actually finding beavers and relocating them. They have a beaver relocation program that they've set up um, from Utah State University where they actually trap the beavers, check them, make sure they're healthy, and then keep them in a makeshift, you know, pseudo dam until they're bunker, until they're ready to be replaced back in the areas with need the fire and drought resistance care. And they're hoping that the beavers will then do what beavers do best, which is build dams and create these um, reservoirs of water that will then help prevent the fire and the drought conditions because they're actually saving and conserving water. And it's interesting, you know, it's again sort of like maybe we would have been better if we'd let the beavers sort of live in harmony with us uh, because the beavers sort of are critical to our ecosystem and they're very, you know, um, quite savvy animals. Uh, they are, you know, depositing basically, one of the researchers said it was sort of like the beavers were building up a water bank where they're depositing water by creating through these reservoirs and these dams into something that they can draw on later to help prevent uh, droughts and also create fire resistant areas. And if you think about it, um, beavers do have a natural function and actually without man, animals got along just fine, but beavers by, by cutting down trees and by building dams, they're actually getting rid of a lot of the fire hazardous materials too, because they're using them to create the dams. So I just always think it's wonderful when man finally figures out that maybe we would have been better off leaving the beavers in the in the land, in the forest, as opposed to having to rehome them later. And what the funniest part about this story that, that kind of caught my eye is they're calling these analog dams. I'm like, well, of course they're analog, they're not digital. The point is they're actually helping the beavers build dams, making sure they remember how to. So when they're released back in these areas, they'll do their do what beavers do best, and that is create dams, and then of course, save and preserve water and the land and prevent droughts, all the reasons beavers were here in the first place. So you're watching the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host. And we come back, I'll be talking about the promise and perils of demand response programs. We'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Did you know that you
Your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Hi, welcome back to the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network. I'm your host, Dr. Katherine Johnson. And today we're talking about the promises and perils of demand response programs or DR programs. Demand response programs have actually been around for quite a while, back since the 1960s. And they're basically just a way that an electric utility, primarily an electric utility, encourages their customers to shift their usage from a very high peak time to a low peak time. For example, encouraging customers to run their dishwashers or cook their food not at six at night, but maybe do a delayed wash at eight or nine. Now it can't work for everything, and obviously you can't you know, alter the behavior of all of your electric appliances, but it's really been a load shifting program for a very long time, and then it'd be called something fancier called demand response. And the reason that utilities are promoting demand response is the same reason they're promoting energy efficiency. It just makes good sense. They're complementary services. If you can encourage customers to first reduce their overall amount of energy they're using through energy efficiency, and then use the peak demand energy, the one that, you know, when it's very scarce, most expensive, a lot more wisely, it's a better deal for the customers, and it's also certainly better on the grid for the electric providers. And, of course, if you have a demand response program, they've actually, one of the think tanks, American Council for Energy Efficiency, says it's, you know, a complementary approach. And really, it makes sense because they're avoiding the construction of new power plants, which we know is always a challenging and often uh, debated issue, as well as helping to avoid purchase. Because just like anything else in an open market, when electricity is scarce, the price of it goes way up, you know, as we're seeing in Europe. And it also enhances grid reliability and helps reduce, again, the concern about the reliance on fossil fuels. So there's a lot of good benefits to demand response programs. And they, as I said, have been around for a long, long time. The utilities have been playing around with all different types of designs. Most of them are, there's actually 14 different program designs. I'm only familiar with a few of them where they're offering some sort of incentive to like lower your thermostat during the hot summer months or doing an interruptible rate. If you agree to like run your irrigation pumps at a different time than the peak, you'll get a discounted rate on your bill for agricultural customers or um, time of use, another type of sort of direct kind of encouraging you to use your utility uh, appliances off peak demand and also price peaking and tariffs. I mean, it gets very, very complicated and, and there's a lot of mathematical models that go into determining how much the incentives should be which all sounds great. I mean, you know, the customers are going to save energy and the utility doesn't have to go buy kilowatts on, on the open market or megawatts, which are very expensive. However, um, like all good strategies, not everything works as, as planned. In fact, there was some news not too long ago about the thermostat program by Excel Energy, who's not just in Colorado, but it's in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and a few other states, actually... Um, shut off customers' air conditioners without their knowledge. Now, these customers, in all fairness, had signed up for a demand response program where they get an incentive to help. They'll get a, they'll get a free thermostat, and then they'll get 25 bucks a year if the utility can go and lower their temperature down or raise their temperature during really peak demand, high, high hot summer days, a few times a year. But this catch was always that they could lower, they could, they could alter their thermostat settings 
raising their thermostat settings during the high temperature times and then then lowering it down after a few hours and that was sort of the implicit bargain but the customer always had the option to opt out to say no i'm not going to i'm going to override it i'm not i'm not going to be at work that day i don't want to be sitting in a sweltering house that's 80 degrees um, on a hot summer day i want to you know i'm going to set my thermostat back down to 74 or something well xl energy sort of took that voluntary part of the demand response out of the customer's hands and actually just arbitrarily controlled all of the thermostats for all of the thousands of customers that had been signed up for their program, which of course created all kinds of consternation and concern. Some of the customers were worried that maybe they were being cyber hacked because these are Wi-Fi thermostats, very smart thermostats, and maybe that somebody hacked them and they're controlling their thermostats. Or, um, But it was 22,000 customers or one and a half percent of their total customer base who had signed up for this program and then we're finding out that no, they didn't have the option. The voluntary option had actually been eliminated. And they said, well, you know, it was in the fine print. We said that, you know, if, if, if you know, we can always had that option, but of course they didn't say that when they were selling the program, now did they? And that created a lot of consternation because ultimately what the customers have learned through these demand response programs and thermostats are just one example. Other examples are, and I've talked about, the electric vehicle charging, when you're told you can't charge your electric vehicle that they wanted you to buy um, because of the peak demand. So one of the problems is that it becomes sort of, wait a minute, is it becoming kind of a big brother? I thought I was going to do something voluntarily to help my economy and help the utility and help the environment, but no, wait a minute, I've lost all measure of, of control. So it becomes almost a little, in my mind, Orwellian. Um, and this happened in Texas, too, where they didn't even give you a money. They gave you a chance to win a sweepstakes. And they did the same thing in Texas during a heat wave. And they've also had problems, not surprising, in China, where there's a lot less self, you know, self-choice. They've done the same thing in China. Now, you would expect China to, to sort of control user behavior. I wouldn't quite expect it so much from utilities in Texas and Colorado. And one of the other interesting things about demand response programs, and I, I've worked on them a lot in evaluating them. They're very similar in terms of the energy efficiency uh, benefits. But one of the things is that I found an article that I'll have to talk about in more detail at, at some point, but attack of the smart thermostats. The way that the demand programs have been set up, they're now all set to all shut off, turn on at six in the morning. So there's an immediate spike on the grid at six in the morning, which in itself creates a problem. So again, um, they're well-intended programs, but nobody really thinks about the consequences if you program thousands and thousands of thermostats to start in at, two, at six in the morning, that's gonna create another strain on the grid. So that's some of the problems and the perils of demand side or demand response programs. I'm Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. We'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. 
Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Hello, this is Katherine Johnson on the Bold Brave TV Network. I'm your host for the KJ Show. And we've been talking about smart thermostats and a few other interesting topics like the Queen Elizabeth's uh, wind, shore, wind farms and, of course, my, one of my favorite creatures, beavers. But I'd also like to have you join in the conversation at 866-451-1451. Um, one of the interesting things uh, I love doing about this show is I find all kinds of little tidbits in the news that doesn't really get a lot of airplay. So, um, and it's, and you'd be surprised how much energy news is a part of the everyday news cycle now. I, I'm actually starting to hear little references to things I've talked about or ideas I've had pop up to the, pop up on other channels. So I don't know if it's osmosis or great minds think alike, but energy really is such an important part of our lives. And speaking of energy, one of the most interesting things I just found was that there's now a European game show. You know how the Japanese have all kinds of crazy game shows? Well, so does the so do the Europeans. They actually now have a European game show based on the Hunger Games, big surprise, where the custom, you know, contestants compete to win all kinds of prizes. And you know, I'm thinking like the price is right and you get a new sofa or you get a new car. No, the the prize they're giving away on game shows is the ability they the, the prize is they will pay your electric bill your energy bill for the next four months, which is akin to the price of a lot of a lot of groceries or, a lot, or quite quite thousands and thousands of dollars. Because in Britain, they actually have to prepay their bills. They actually have to pay in advance. It's a pay as you go program. So these folks who want to not want to run out of heating oil or heat in the middle of the night have to go in and put monies like in the parking meter. And so they're saying it's thin. The bills are crazily high. In fact. That was one of the things the new prime minister was going to talk about uh, before the world sort of changed subjects for a little bit. And um, so they have this uh, energy efficient game show and the prize, the prize is uh, winning money to pay for your electric bill. How scary is that? And how prophetic, perhaps? Um, another fun, fun thing while we're waiting for people to call in, 866-451-1451 uh, is, um, I, this is, again, under you can't make this stuff up. But apparently a Tesla car exploded as it was being charged in the showroom. Now the showroom was a garage, of course, and they had it plugged in and all of a sudden it caught on fire. And apparently nobody would think goodness was hurt, but it caught on fire, uh, not spontaneously. They just, the battery just went boom. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not probably the best salesmanship you can have when your electric vehicle <laughs> battery catches on fire when you're trying to promote the benefits of electric vehicles. And clearly going on fire is not one of the benefits that I'm sure Elon Musk was thinking about when he was thinking about buying, um, making these cars. Um, and then the other interesting thing, keeping on the electric vehicle front is I keep finding out more and more uh, disturbing information about the sort of mixed up math that's used to justify the expense of electric vehicles. Like electric vehicles are supposed to be able to, you know, burn cleaner, last longer, they're environmentally better than the internal combustion engine that we know and love. However, when you start digging in behind, like as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story, you find out that EV aren't so green after all. It actually takes 1,800 gallons of fuel in a 12-hour shift to move 5,000 pounds of earth in order to generate minerals for one yeah, looks like right. you have a caller. Hey, John. Sometimes it's... Oh, hi. Hi, hi, Catherine. Hey, I've got a question around sure. smart thermostats. Do you feel that there's a legitimate privacy concern with those? Yes, I do. Absolutely. In fact, um, one of the things I was going to mention in my next segment, are you sure you didn't get ahead of the show, is actually about smart thermostats. And Sorry. one of the problems they have is the fact that customers don't like the intrusive nature of a smart thermostat. I think it's very big brotherish myself. 
And now when we see that utilities can arbitrarily take control of your thermostat, you wonder what else they can do. So kind of the same reason I don't have an Alexa, because I don't want people listening into my conversations. I don't really am not a big fan personally of smart thermostats. Now, I am not to say that they aren't good and important. But yeah, you raise a really important point about privacy. And that's one of the stumbling blocks that uh, they haven't been able to figure out yet. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for calling. And um, I'm getting back to, uh, I will talk about um, smart thermostats in the next segment, but I wanted to kind of wrap up, um, if I don't have any other callers, I wanted to wrap up one other thing about the EVs. And I'm going to actually, no doubt, revisit electric vehicles in much more detail later on. But it basically takes 500,000 pounds of earth to make the battery for one Tesla uh, car. Um, and then I've talked already about the issues of the environmental damages and it's, you know, and, and it's not, it's, it's really when you start digging into it deeper, you start realizing that when you start mining for lithium, whether it's in Chile or Nevada or other place in the Congo, where they're actually mining for these rare earth chemicals, rare earth products and minerals, they're actually creating a lot of environmental harm. And no one has really examined or sort of pointed out that the lithium that they're mining in Chile has led to a drought because they basically drained all the water to, to all the water disappeared in the place where they're where their reserve where the largest one of the largest locations of lithium reserves are because of the mining operations. And then if you start digging deeper, the UN has done an entire study of all the dangers that man-made mining creates from an environmental and human human point of view like they get something called man camps where you get all these men and miners get together and i don't know if you're familiar with the wild west uh, i have a place out in colorado where there's a lot of stories about what the wild co the silver miners used to do i don't think that miners are inherently any better or different 100 years later so when you get a lot of men in a camp things bad things tend to happen in terms of violence and trafficking and prostitution and in addition to the environmental problems of destroying the lakes and the waters and the dams that are the natural um, earth around it. So what they're actually trying now, and the UN is trying to sort of um, kind of weigh this, like do we really need lithium mined in Congo, one of the poorest parts, one of the poorest countries in, in Africa, using children that have been forced into labor in order to fuel our electric vehicles? And what they've determined is that actually, you know who's going to benefit from the electric vehicle surge? It's not the third world nations where we're taking their minerals. It's the first world nations. It's the exact same argument that the climate um, people use to say how America and Britain and the first world countries are evil and we need to you know, re reapportion our resources, except we're the ones benefiting from the electric vehicle boom, but we're not, but we're, but we're, not, but we're causing environmental harm in the, in the, along the way. And I don't think it's that much different than when, say, the British Empire went into Africa or the French or the Germans or the Portuguese went in and basically robbed and, you know, took all, the, took all their minerals. How is that different? How is that colonialism idea different from when we had an imperial empire to what we're doing now in terms of the electric vehicles? And I think as we start reassessing the benefits and costs of electric vehicles, we really have to take a step back and say, not only does it cause environmental harm, it actually causes um, increased carbon dioxide. It causes all kinds of uh, third and a half metric tons of the world's supply of, of, um, of uh, lithium is in the Congo, which is being decimated. Um, but they're also saying that coal by, cobalt mining actually creates many, many more carbon emissions than the carbon dioxide it will reduce through electric vehicles. And that's one of the reasons the Congo now has one of the highest carbon emission generation, uh, carbon footprint in the, in the, on the planet. So again, I think that electric vehicles have a place, but I don't think they have a place at the accelerated pace that the politicians on, on, are pushing. And I really think we need to take a step back and think about what's best for the planet long term. But anyway, I'm Katherine Johnson on the Bull Brave TV network. I'll be right back and continue the conversation about smart thermostats. Have a great day. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant. Like I had 
relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Hello, I'm Katherine Johnson, the host of the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network, and today we're talking about the poll promises and perils of demand response programs. And I alluded to it a little bit in the earlier segment and my, and my friend John also talked about smart thermostats. So I wanted to explore a little bit more about what exactly is a smart thermostat and what are they good or bad? And the answer is it depends like everything else that's really complicated. But first of all, smart thermostats are really a com really critical component of most of the demand response programs that are currently operating. There are demand response programs that can control water heaters that have been very successful for a long time. There are demand response programs that control irrigation wells and um, you know been used in rural electric co-ops for a long time to kind of when the water's going to go or when you're going to or when you're going to do these things. But thermostats, especially Wi-Fi thermostats, are especially appealing to utility programs because um, they can be controlled through the Wi-Fi and you can actually program it. And they have a lot of neat features. A wi a, you know, it's a Wi-Fi enabled device that automatically adjusts heating and cooling for optimal performance. And optimal is, I guess, what you can determine what it is, or perhaps on a hot day, the utility will determine what optimal performance is. But, um, but one of the things I guess I really was concerned about is that there's a lot of great smart thermostats out there. And if you have one, that's terrific. And they do add a lot of good ideas. There's convenience, there's a lot of, um, you know, they can provide temperature settings. And if you are very temperature sensitive, you know, that could be very good. It's also a good way to control your temperature settings when you're out, maybe if you're working out of the, out of the home or working, or working somewhere or on vacation schedules. So there's a lot of good benefits from them. You can control them, obviously, and sort of tweak them to your personal preferences. And if you're uh, an energy nerd like I am, um, then you can actually get some insights just to see how your energy operates. And that is actually very invaluable information to the electric utilities too. They have a process called disaggregation where they actually can go and, and, and examine your energy usage from a, either heating and cooling and they can really design ways to help you reduce your demand during those critical peak times. Energy Star um, tests these thermostats, you know, independently and verifies them. And there's a lot of different brands out there. And how, however, um, and, the, and both gas and electric utilities have been promoting these types of programs to control primarily your air conditioner in your, in your furnace. Um, but I was talking to a little bit earlier and I didn't quite get all the way through it. And then I'm glad I didn't because now I remembered I was supposed to talk about it here was that what we found out though with this massive amounts of smart thermostat programs that are pre-wired, they come in and they install, the, the utility will hire an installer to um, put in a smart thermostat because most of us don't know how to do that. Or if you're, if you're really clever and you can have their bring your own thermostat program um, and that way you can pick what thermostat you want, whether you want a Nest or a Kobe or something else. And, but you get an incentive. The, basically, the utility pretty much covers most, if not all, the upfront cost 
of the of the smart thermostat and the installation cost is pretty minor so they do make it very attractive for customers to be able to come in and participate in their program in an exchange the customer then agrees like i said to reduce their voluntarily reduce their usage and the utility will control those smart thermostats but the problem has been and this was a new study that just came out from cornell university Again, I don't come up with these ideas from, you know, wacko magazines or wacko places. These are vetted studies, peer-reviewed research that has been done. And I wouldn't exactly put Cornell University on the forefront of any conservative movements out there. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're Ivy League. But one of the things they figured out and they discovered is that the happening is because all of these thermostats are getting programmed by to all start on at six in the morning, and I was mentioning it actually creates all kinds of trouble for the grid because the grid all of a sudden has this challenge of um, how in the world are we going to make up for this huge increase in demand all of a sudden at six o'clock in the morning. We have a caller. Hello, this is Nicholas from Maryland. Hello, Nicholas. What was your question? Well, this is actually of an earlier topic. The other okay. day I was with my family buying clothes at a clothes at JCPenney and I saw an an outlet for electric cars, but it only works for one type of car, Tesla. And it makes me wonder, what about all the other electric cars out there? <laughs> that's a really good point. And that's the excellent point. And, and uh, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, the mall does have a EV charging for Teslas only, and that's pretty unfortunately pretty commonplace in a lot of different places. Um, that's a smart strategy by Tesla, uh, but that is one of the other barriers we have from in developing an infrastructure that's going to have um, the charging stations. You know, it took us a long time to build um, the standard oil gas stations that are on every other, used to be on every corner or along the highways and. And, you know, it took a, quite a while, 20 or 30 years before we had gas stations that were close to each other so people could actually plan long distance trips. And now they don't have no uniform charging uh, platform yet. You have Tesla and then you have other cars that use other charging systems that maybe can only they can charge from their home, which creates all kinds of problems. And again, to your point, Nicholas, um, makes it even more difficult for folks who have electric cars to plan trips more than the range of their batteries or to find alternative charging stations. Um, and there's also uh, costs associated with those charging stations. Sometimes people don't realize that when they go into the Walmart to charge their car, they're actually gonna have to pay for that as well. Uh, it's not free. Uh, electricity is never free, but just because you don't see it every day, you sometimes think it is. But great question, Nicholas. Thank you for calling. Thank All you right. for having Thank me. You're welcome. So the other thing I was getting back to, and he makes a really good point. Um, the other thing I wanted to get back to is just to wrap up this segment is they're actually now calling this um, the attack of the smart thermostats because the grid, frankly, we already know it's old. We already know it's, it's, it's in its structure is not in great shape. So now we're promoting all these demand response programs with smart thermostats to all turn on at the same time every day. And that creates another demand on the grid. So we're actually, in, a, in an attempt to reduce our electricity usage during peak times, we're creating another artificial peak with all these program thermostats and folks don't even know how to unprogram them. I mean, the, it's they're deliberately not encouraged to de deprogram them. That's the whole reason they're in the, in, the, in the programs to begin with in these activities. But it is very interesting that now um, they're realizing that they have hundreds of thousands of program thermostats and they're creating another electric spike. Um, I just love the energy business. Uh, this is Katherine Johnson. You're on the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network, and we'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like, it was almost instant. Like, I had relief right away creating better health relationships careers and finances let shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness definitely something's happening uh it's like a, a flow inside you know it feels good whether in person or online shiraz provides personal coaching belief shifting visit shiraz at energeticmagic.com 
or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, Hope, and Support for Caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Hello, and welcome back to the KJ Show. You're on the Bold Brave TV network with uh, Dr. Catherine Chachin, your host. And we certainly would love to have you call in and continue our conversations about smart thermostats and energy efficiency in general. Um, one of the interesting things about the notion of demand response programs, and again, it goes way back to the 1960s when the government, when the utilities were trying to think of different ways to encourage energy usage. And I don't have anything for, against demand response programs. Many of my clients actually have very successful demand response programs that work very well. I don't want this to be a, you shouldn't do this kind of program. But what I really want to point out is that like everything else, it's in moderation that it makes sense. It, it's good to have um, programs available for customers who are able to uh, shift their energy usage to a different time. And one of my most, my favorite commercials I've ever seen, or it was a really very clever ad campaign by a Pennsylvania utility where they actually um, colored in the hours of the day when they really, really wanted you to do your heavy duty uh, washing and, and household chores. And it was like, you know, after eight, it's, you know, and that was, they had some very clever, like had light switched um, stickers and they had very clever marketing to kind of help people adjust and change their behavior. Because as we know, behavior modification is difficult. And those types of programs make sense. Um, they're a lot easier to implement. They're basically called time of use rates. And they are getting customers to modify behavior during peak times. Where the challenge comes in is when you start introducing things like smart thermostats, and then you are also having peak customers being able to modify or not modify their behavior accordingly. And so that's one of the things that really struck out, stuck out to me was when I was reading these articles about not just Cal, uh, Colorado, but Texas and even in China, where how obtrusive do we want these businesses to be? I mean, we want to, we're Americans, right? We want to retain the control in our, in, of, our, of our lives. Of course, we also want to you know, conserve our resources and use them wisely. So this notion that smart thermostats are great, but probably should think about how should we program them differently and how can we program them to not all turn on at six in the morning and create another artificial peak in the system, which is exactly what you're trying to avoid by having a demand response program. So I, I think when I talk to my friends in the design program design part of this business, I'm gonna ask them, can we maybe stagger the operating time? Uh, you know, there's gotta be other ways to encourage this behavior without physically turning off their thermostats during heat waves. A couple other things that are interesting about demand response and smart thermostats in general is um, they actually are very clever. They learn your behavior, which again to me is a little bit on the big brother side of things. So maybe I'm just too old and I'm not a, a technology aficionado like some of my, my younger folks in my industry or in my family who really love all these gadgets. But I have a little bit of a fear uh, about having thermostats that learn my behavior simply because I don't know if I want anybody to understand my behavior, certainly from a from a operational point of view. And secondly, I am the worst person in the world to have a smart thermostat because I have a very narrow temperature band. Um, I like, it's a very narrow temperature of where I like to be. 
And it's sort of me. And since I work at home, I kind of like, well, you know, I'm not enrolled in a demand response program for my utility, so I'm going to be comfortable because I work at home. I know it's the complete antithesis, antithesis of what an energy efficiency expert could be. But frankly, you know, we all at the end of the day have to do what's best for us and our comfort and our and our as well as our health and safety. And of course, I care about the world and energy efficiency. That's why I'm in this business. But um, I, I save energy in lots of other ways, just not setting my thermostat um, way too high in the summer or way too low in the winter. Um, but I do wear sweaters like Jimmy Carter told us to do. I think the other, um, the other interesting issue that we have is how far along, and this is what John was talking about, is how much more obtrusive or how much more do we want to have outside entities like um, utilities or Alexa come into our lives and actually kind of hear what we're doing, see what we're doing. And then maybe, you know, it, it sounds great in theory. It sounds like the Jetsons, you know, you'll, your refrigerator will automatically order the groceries and they'll send an article out and you'll get a, an order and you'll get a DoorDash delivery and you'll have your shopping list. And there's a lot of wonderful ideas about having these smart homes and these automated devices. And I'll talk more about smart homes in another episode, but you just really think about the the benefits of these technologies and then then they start really getting really smart and sometimes i don't want the appliances in my home to be smarter than i am it's just a little to me it's a little creepy i also um you know think that there's certain benefits to being able to monitor energy usage and monitor you know heating and cooling usage for for individuals of course customers who are um in critical medical uh, conditions, they obviously need to make sure that their energy is never cut off. In fact, one of the programs that I work with in Maryland has a special track for low-income customers who have critical medical needs, and when their furnace or air conditioner doesn't work, they get a fast track to get it repaired and replaced because they're obviously vulnerable and they need to, they need to not be on a demand response program. So there are a lot of benefits by understanding customer energy usage. And there's a lot of ways that we can tailor offers to customers. But I also don't want it to overstep the bounds and to start telling us how to live. Because again, as an American, I kind of bristle at that. I, I, I know what I should do and what I shouldn't do. But at the end of the day, I'm the one paying the bill. And I ought to be able to decide to some degree how I want to spend my hard earned dollars. So. Um, as we go forward, I will be talking in future episodes about smart homes and behavior programs. And in a couple episodes from now, I'll actually be in France broadcasting from very wonderful places. And I'll be sharing some of the energy issues and energy ideas that we find when we go to France and, and um, talk a lot about the European challenges. I have a whole show just on European challenges coming up. But right now, you're watching the Bold Brave TV network. I'm Katherine Johnson, your host. And on the KJ Show, we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Hey, welcome back to the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network. I'm Katherine Johnson, your host, and we've been talking today about the perils and promises of uh, and unintended consequences often of demand response programs. 
And we also talked a little bit about some of the breaking news that's been happening around the world. Obviously, um, the, the Queen's passing is a historic moment. Um, I happen to be quite a big fan of hers for a lot of reasons. Probably one of the reasons I'm such a big fan is she loves dogs. And so do I. I realized the other day when I was on a business trip that I had a purse that had dogs on it. I had socks that had dogs on it. I had t-shirts with dogs on it. My key ring has a dog paw. So I'm like, well, I guess I am kind of a dog lover. And of course she was too. And that I think is probably one of the more endearing qualities about her. And yes, the dog, the corgis will be well taken care of. But I think it really says a lot about a person who as famous as she was and as wealthy as she was, the dogs knew her. The dogs knew she was a good person. And if, she, if her dogs liked her, then she must be an okay person because dogs have a really, really good judge of character. Um, I have this um, t-shirt, again, I collect dog things, and I was in St. Louis, uh, Hannibal, Missouri, actually, about a year ago, and I'm a huge Mark Twain fan, love Mark Twain and all of his books, but he had a lot of different um, versions and views of, on life. Um, he wasn't exactly the most religious fellow, but he did, was an animal lover. He not only loved bicycles, but he loved cats and dogs. And he has this, this saying that he said, heaven is by merit. Heaven is by favor. If you go by merit, your dog gets in before you do. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, you're right. Um, dogs really are the best judges of character we have. Um, there's, my mother used to say that dogs were angels with tails. And I think that's one of the reasons that not only was Queen Elizabeth so loved, because she had 30 corgis, and they're kind of annoying little dogs, but, you know, she loved them. But the dogs, you know, just knew who she was, knew, didn't know who she was in terms of the queen. They just knew she was that nice lady that fed them and walked them and she played with them. And I'm thinking if I'm the queen of the, England or queen of Britain, you know, it's nice to have at least some people in your circle who love you for who you truly are and not just because of your station in life. And that's why I happen to love my dogs, because even no matter what day I'm having, whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, if I'm, you know, working too hard, my dogs will tell me it's time for me to take a walk, not them. And dogs are also, you know, been proven for your mental health. I've also found out in researching this program that now there's even special energy efficient pet doors that are being sold to dog lovers in uh, California. When they're, you know, if you're going to put in a pet door, make sure you put in an energy efficient one. So I'm thinking even even the energy efficiency community is catching on that Americans love their dogs and dogs are a critical part of our families. And let's make sure they're energy efficient uh, doors for them too. And there's a lot of articles actually about how to make sure your house is well cared for when you're out of town or your dog when you're at work and your dog is home. So, which kind of makes me wonder um, how were the dogs affected when XL just sort of arbitrarily raised the temperature in everyone's homes? So, another reason to be concerned about this overstepping perhaps of barriers or of boundaries. But anyway, this has been the Catherine, Sh the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Catherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And next time, I'll talk about something really clever: uh, smart homes. Talk to you later. Have a great week. Thanks for joining. Bye bye. How was that? This has been the KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares know, her know. insights Justin. to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience Justin. as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here Justin. on the KJ Show.